Low back, low most of your back. Some of us are still coming back from the break. That's fine. We'll make our way in one by one. But until then, is it 10 minutes? Is it eight minutes? 11 minutes? Six and a half. Six and a half. So I'm starting too soon. I like timers. Can't argue with timers. Timers is as timers, timers was. So I said a word about them. But anyway, I got the microphone. Yeah. So I went to the library. Great suggestion. Thank you. They told me it was a tech support issue. Didn't realize that. So, so then I went to tech support. They had a big box of batteries. I guess this is like a dedicated problem to have from time to time. They even had a proposed culprit that would have used up the microphone batteries. I didn't recognize the name, but yeah, apparently somebody is using up the microphone batteries at your law school. Find that person. Find them. All right, how's the time you're doing? Is it 10 minutes yet? It's 10 minutes? All right. It's not. It is. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about Florida sunshine laws. Here's the question. What's the answer? Here's the question. The government violates Florida sunshine law. That's right. So during rocking sunshine law breakers are in our midst. Is that a problem without a remedy? In our hypothetical, the government violates Florida sunshine law and in so doing, takes an official action, such as passing an ordinance or a law or any of the myriad things that government might do. So my question then is, what relief is available? Did you notice part of our chapter had an exhaustive list of relief? Let's look at this list of relief here. Ah, your relief, if I can find that page. We're still on breaks, so a little pause doesn't matter, right? Looking forward at page. Sunshine Law Remedies. Here we go. One, entry of a declaratory judgment holding the action taken in violation of the Florida Sunshine Law to be null, void, and unenforceable. How about that? So I prove a violation of the Sunshine Law. That could be a defense for my client who violated the law that was subsequently enacted but enacted in violation of the Sunshine Law. How about that? So our Sunshine Law, so open government, our government accountability, is a higher priority than enforcing the law that was passed in violation of the Sunshine Law. Interesting. Another option, a non-criminal infraction punishable by a fine not exceeding $500 or work against any public officer. Interesting. Thank you, elected official, for serving the public, but you violated Florida Sunshine Law. Now open your wallet and pay a fine. Another list, a second degree misdemeanor for knowingly attending a meeting held in violation of the Sunshine Law, a war against any person who is a member of a board or commission or of any state agency or authority of any county, municipal corporation, or local subdivision. Whoa. A minute ago, we talked about our good public servants having to open their wallets to pay a fine. Now we're talking about going to jail, losing their freedom for being a part. Did you see that? For knowingly attending a meeting held in violation of the Sunshine Law. So you're an elected official, maybe you're on the Board of County Commissioners, and you're at the meeting, and it doesn't seem to be in compliance with the Sunshine Law. What best for you to do? Just sit there and attend it anyway? Yeah, you might end up sitting in jail and attending some jail time, too, as well as that financial fine. A second-degree misdemeanor for, for conduct occurring outside the state of Florida that would constitute a knowing violation of Florida's sunshine law. Wow. Your neighborhood-friendly lobbyist just wants to send you on an all-expense-paid vacation. Coincidentally, you happen to be an elected official 
on a board that's about to take a vote that affects the lobbyist's interests. Should you go on the all expense paid vacation? Probably not, because it could be followed by another vacation, a vacation in jail. Taxable costs of the litigation awarded against the non prevailing party or parties. Reasonable attorney fees against the guilty agency. Reasonable attorney fees against the guilty individuals. In other words, the commission provided that in any case where the board or commission seeks the advice of its attorney and such advice is followed, then no such fees shall be assessed against the individual member. However, this subsection shall not apply to a state attorney or any officer charged with enforcing the provisions of this section. So what's the lesson, what is the takeaway? The board tells us this. No resolution, rule, or formal action shall be considered binding except as taken or made at such meeting that complies with the Sunshine Law. Any person who knowingly violates Florida's Sunshine Law is guilty of a misdemeanor of the second degree. All right, that's not a life felony, but it's also not fun. Probably don't want to be convicted of a misdemeanor of the second degree, right? Conduct which occurs outside the state which would constitute a known violation of this, sec of this section, that too is a misdemeanor of the second degree. Here's a different question. Can you answer this one based on your opinions? You give a free consultation to an impoverished new client. You believe your potential new client is the victim of a sunshine law violation. Can you take the case on a contingency fee basis? Who wants to hazard a guess as to this question? Can you do it? Can you do it? Yes, you can. Would you do it? Well, you might. You might if you want to do pro bono work, but you also might if you want to get paid. Well, again, we look at the fact pattern. It's an impoverished new client. They can't afford to pay me. That's okay. Remember that list? of potential remedies we just went over, one of them was what? Yeah, reasonable attorney fees against the guilty agency. And in certain, almost unique circumstances, reasonable attorney fees against the guilty individuals. Let's take a closer look at this attorney fee provision. Quote, you see it on the big board, quote, the court shall assess a reasonable attorney fee against such agency and may assess a reasonable attorney's fee against the individual filing such an action if the court finds it was filed in bad faith or was frivolous. Does that mean that the prevailing party wins attorney fees? The phrase I just read you, the phrase on the big board, does that mean the prevailing party gets attorney fees? No, it does not. It's not a two-way street that you see up on the big board. You see different standards based on who prevailed. You see a very difficult standard for the government if it prevails. You see a far looser or easier or more liberal or more easy to meet standard for the individual who prevails against the governmental party. Let's take a close look at that. It's not a two-way street because if the agency is found guilty of the Sunshine Law violation, then the court shall, meaning must, meaning will, the court shall assess a reasonable attorney fee. So you can take the case on a contingency, even if you have an impoverished client who can't pay, because you've got a government who can and who will, by court order, if you prevail. Now, does that mean if you lose, you'll be paying the government's fee? Probably not. Because the standard for you or your client to pay the government if you lose your fight under the Sunshine Law, the standard is much higher. The standard is that the court finds you had a frivolous claim or the court finds that you filed in bad faith. If you lost, does that mean your claim is frivolous? The legal answer is no. 
lost the claim is not the same as having filed a frivolous claim in the eyes of the law. If you lost the claim, does that mean you made it in bad faith? Again, the legal answer is no. The mere fact that you lost the claim is not proof that it was filed in bad faith and is not proof that the claim was frivolous, either at the time it was filed or at the time it was pursued. You can bring a claim in good faith that is not frivolous and still lose. I've met many an opposing counsel that filed a claim in good faith but still lost. And unfortunately, I have lost claims that I brought in good faith. Sometimes lawyers win, sometimes lawyers lose. Just because a lawyer lost doesn't mean it was in bad faith, it does not mean it was frivolous. So you see how you can take a claim of an impoverished client or a rich one on a contingency case if it's a sunshine law. But the question is, would you? Who here would take such a claim on a contingency? No one? Yeah. Would we'll be going against the agency? Yeah. Yeah. So at the intake stage, when the potential client is still potential and not actual, do your research then. Well, of course, if it's frivolous, you're not going to bring it. And if it's in bad faith, you're not going to bring it. Oh, if the agency is frivolous and you represent the individual, great claim to bring. Great claim. So you do your research before you transform the potential client into your client and you determine whether or not you're going to win. If you are comfortable enough with the likelihood of winning, you can take the case on a contingency basis. Why not? And this is a wonderful thing for our fellow Floridians who can't afford us lawyers. And it's a wonderful thing for our fellow Floridians that want to keep government on its toes and make sure that government has an adequate incentive to always follow the Sunshine Law. So that answers the question. In any case where the board or commission seeks the advice of its attorney and such advice is followed, no such fees shall be assessed against the individual member or members of the board or commission. So the board was wrong, the government was wrong, and lost the sunshine battle. With certainty, the government now owes attorney fees to the citizen who brought the claim. But the individual members of the board might not be individually liable. One of the defenses they might have is that they relied on the advice of counsel. That can be their defense to personal liability. Here's a question. Your client didn't like what your client was hearing when your client attended a government agency's meeting. So without telling anyone, your, your client took out what? Cell phone. He what? He record surreptitiously. But security noticed what was going on. Busted. So security grabbed your client. Oh, make it as dramatic as you like. Dragged him out kicking and screaming. I don't know. Threw the cell phone on the ground, stamped on it. Threw him down the stairs. Or make it less dramatic. Just quietly walked over and said, you need to shut that off now. Either way, who's in the wrong here? The government or your client? When the government stops citizens from surreptitiously recording, and just about all of us can do that nowadays, right? From surreptitiously recording, who's in the wrong? Who will raise their hand and say, the citizen, sneaky citizen, the citizens in the wrong, who will raise their hand and say that? Put your hand down. Who instead will raise your hand and say, the government was wrong here. The government was wrong. That's correct. The government was wrong. The public may record a government meeting using any non-destructive means. Now, in the fact pattern, it was surreptitious. 
just took out the cell phone and hit record. But any non-disruptive means. Maybe the media is just quietly assembled in the back room with their cameras rolling. Yeah. Maybe even the speaker feels disturbed about that, starts pointing at them. Fake news in the back row. That's they're still allowed to be there under Florida Sunshine Law. So the public may record the meeting using any non-destructive means, including secret or covert methods of an audio video. The government doesn't have the right to stop that. The public under the Sunshine Law has the right to make its own recordings of government meetings. Now remember, the government still had to keep minutes, right? And record, by which I mean preserve, those minutes. But in addition to those minutes, maybe the citizens want more. Maybe they want to post some of this on their website. Try to get folks upset about what the government's doing. Perhaps citizens want to start a live feed, comment to their followers about what they think the government's doing. All these types of political action are clearly allowed so long as they remain non-disruptive under Florida Sunshine Law. If you've got a client who was shut down, then you've got a case. And you can get paid by the government for prevailing party attorney fees, as well as prevailing costs. And that's important, isn't it? How many of our rights exist today because brave citizens sat where they weren't supposed to sit, ate where they weren't supposed to eat, marched where they weren't supposed to march. This is the kind of civil protest that in our history changed the very hearts and minds of our fellow Americans and led to some of the beautiful civil rights that we have today. It's important that you and I and our fellow Floridians and our fellow Americans have the right to assemble, to protest, to record, to make public. Because without that, we can't affect the very hearts and minds of the citizenry. We can't protect our civil rights. You had a question? Not disruptive means. Yeah. Is there definitions for that or is that That is up to the courts. And that's part of the beauty of Florida Sunshine Law. As we dive deeper down into the statutes and into the case law precedent in our chapter, in particular when we see the actions of Donnell Ray, if indeed it's the one and the same Donnell Ray in all those cases that I've got for you there, what we see is an ability to get case law precedent to flesh out exactly what's meant by these terms. And why do I say there's an ability? It's because those who are litigating these, these issues can do so with the aid of contingency lawyers who can bring these claims knowing that even if their client can't afford to litigate it, the government will pay them in the end. Since the Sunshine Law has that almost one-way street, so to speak, of attorney fees, we can litigate what's meant by reasonable what's meant by non-disruptive. And we can get case law precedent on the books that helps guide our fellow Floridians as to what these terms mean. So the answer is yes, the answer is in the case law. And the case law exists because the attorney fee statute exists. So that's the answer. But let's take a closer look now at our chapter. We talked about last class the case of NCAA versus AP. And what I mean there is the National Collegiate Athletic Association versus Associated Press, 18th Southern 3rd, 1201, Florida's First District Court of Appeal, 2009. Who would like to tell me the facts of that case? Pick a number, page one, two, or three. Page one? Okay. Oh, I've got a volunteer. I was going to randomly pick someone off of page one. You've just saved everyone on page one from being randomly called upon. If your name appears on page one, please thank this young lady. What is your name, please? Nicole. 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 Per Perdoma. 
Everyone, please, a round of applause for Nicole Cologne. Yeah, all right, thank you. See, that is a job well done already. What was going on in NCAA versus AP? Who wanted what? And, and in defense of my alma mater, the Florida State University, the Florida State University, I'm sure this is the one and only and last time that any FSU student ever cheated on anything. Just wanted to throw that out there. But you're right. Yeah, the accusation was some FSU students were cheating. Go on. And um, so then they had to inform the NCAA, and they had to Well done, thank you, well summarized. Uh, tell me this, did it surprise you that these were public records subject to Florida Sunshine Law? I mean, no, but only, but the way I thought about it was in terms of litigation, for example, when things go to trial, it's mm -hmm. But did the court get this one wrong? I don't think so. But let me play devil's advocate. Did the court get this one wrong? Look at this fact over here. It says here that it wasn't the state of Florida. It was the Florida State University. So it's not the legislature. It's not the courts. It's not the city council. It's not the government of the county. It's a school. It's a school. But then again, the school didn't have the records. The school was represented by attorneys. Gray Robinson was the name of the firm. So now we're not once removed, we're twice removed. The university didn't have the records, and the university is not the government. But now Gray Robinson, did they have the records? Notice in the facts that the NCAA endeavored to be paperless, that the transcript was never in the physical possession of Gray Robinson. It was accessed over the World Wide Web. It was read on a video screen by logging onto the NCAA's secure website. The actual piece of paper was not generated by the state of Florida, was not generated by the Florida State University, was not generated by Gray Robinson, was generated by the NCAA, which is not a state of Florida agency, and that paper was generated outside the state of Florida, and that paper never entered the state of Florida. It was just seen on the video screen. So I'm what, four, five, six steps removed from the government generating a piece of paper? So didn't the court therefore get it wrong in finding that this was a public document? And remember, the answer is they got it right. But didn't the government get it wrong? Well, I know they talked to the NCAA, but I don't know if they 
You say the government got it right, how dare you? No, no, but tell me why. Tell me why this was still a public document despite being so many steps removed from being generated by the state of Florida. So break it down step by step. Does the document have to be generated by the state in order to be subject to the Sunshine Law? You say no, and you are correct. It need not be generated by the state of Florida. But now, neither Gray Robinson nor the Florida State University is the state of Florida. Why would they fall subject to the Sunshine Law? Correct. Correct and precise. Right. So we stuck to a particular principle. You're absolutely correct. This court stuck to some principles. Notice this, right before subsection lowercase a, the court correctly notes, Florida courts construe the public records law liberally in favor of the state's policy of open government. If there is any doubt about the application of the law in a particular case, the doubt is resolved how? In favor of disclosing the documents. Sure. So when I said it wasn't the state and then it wasn't the university and then it wasn't Gray Robinson and it wasn't in the physical presence of the state, all I did was cast doubt. How do we resolve such doubts under Florida Sunshine Law? In favor of disclosure of agency. Did you know how broadly? Florida statutes define the term agency. Join me in the notes and questions to consider at the end of this NCAA versus Associated Press. In note four, we've got a definition of agency. It includes every board or commission of the state or of any county or political subdivision. Boards created by no local agreement. The state fair authority, school advisory councils, committees to help screen public jobs. A mayor's group of concerned citizens, a liaison between the mayor's office and the chamber of commerce, a post-election transition team of newly elected officials, private organizations that were created by public entity servant, entities assisting, and on and on and on. We interpret Florida Sunshine Laws to frustrate to all evasive devices. How evasive it would be to simply delegate, to simply outsource, to simply hire a vendor and then say, well, the vendor, sure, was working for the government, but wasn't the government. Is that sufficient to keep the government secret? Is that sufficient to prevent the public from having an open government? Is that sufficient for keeping the records private and not in the public view? And the answer to all three of those questions is no, no, no. We interpret the Sunshine Law to frustrate all such invasive devices. How do we know that? Remember the pork chop gang? Couldn't they have just argued? Well, we're just a bunch of buddies drinking whiskey and playing poker. But that argument was specifically what Florida Sunshine Law was attempting to overcome. So don't fall for such invasive devices because Florida Sunshine Law is designed to frustrate all such evasive devices. Stay with me now in the notes and questions to consider. I jumped ahead by going to number four. Look at number one. And again, number two, when we talk about the Schwab test. And that was a reference to News and Sun Sentinel Company versus Schwab Twitty Enhancer Architectural Group. That was a 1992 decision of Florida Supreme Court, found at 596 Southern 2nd 1029. And it spelled out a very detailed way to analyze whether a seemingly private entity or an outsourced entity or a vendor 
or some other seemingly non-governmental group would be subject to open government and subject to disclosure and subject to sunshine and subject to the public view of their records. And Schwab looks specific, but Schwab too is broadly interpreted under Florida Sunshine Law to avoid such invasive devices. In fact, although Schwab was mentioned in NCAA versus Associated Press, it didn't need to be applied. Why? Because that broad definition of agency encompassed even the Florida State University. And although the Florida State University outsourced its lawyer services, it could have used in-house counsel. Instead, it used Gray Robinson. The choice to use Gray Robinson instead of in-house counsel did not, NOT, did not mean that the public is to be denied public access. The government can't simply shut out the public by outsourcing a task. We know that to be true based on cases such as NCAA versus Associated Press. You have a question, sir? Yes. The difference in this case is the moment it touches the hands of the government or any public entity, or any entity that receives public funding, it's open public access. Well said. Well said. Did everyone follow that? That is certainly one of the takeaways from this NCA versus Associated Press case. Certainly. So there's a conversation about the way Robinson was uh, almost irrelevant. Is that the moment yeah. it touches the government, the moment it touches the NCA's hand, it's open. Yet again, well said. Okay. Yes. And in particular, under these facts, although things were reviewed that more physically in the state, although things were reviewed by outside counsel instead of in-house, they were all done for a public purpose. That is, to protect the public university from NCAA sanctions. And public purpose is also broadly construed under Florida's Sunshine Law. One could try to evade Florida's Sunshine Law with excuses such as, well, it didn't have to do with the grading of the students, or it didn't have to do with the tuition or the hiring of professors. It was only the optional academics and then whether the academics that already took place in the past would be, the win column would be reduced because of a sanction. None of these evasive devices would carry the day. None of that would be enough to hide the government's action because we also broadly construe whether or not it was for a public purpose. And almost without fail, if it's a legitimate purpose of the public entity, then it's going to qualify as a public purpose under Florida's Sunshine Law, which is liberally construed to let the sun shine in. So yes, well said. Those are all takeaways from this case. Yes? So in, in that instance, would this have been a different outcome if the university was private? Oh, great question. Would this have a different outcome if the university was private? Probably yes. I must preface my yes with a probably because laws are liberally construed when it comes to Florida Sunshine Law. Public purpose, agency, all these things are liberally construed. We know that under Florida Statutes Chapter 120, which is where we get our agency definition from, that you find in note four of the notes and questions to consider, that a state school meets the definition of agency, but a private school does not. So we know that it's excluded statutorily from the definition of agency. So that's why I would say, yes, it would change the outcome. But I preface my yes with probably, because there can be state functions that could be delegated to private entities, such as a private university. So depending on what it is exactly the private university is doing, that might make the private universities records public under the Florida Sunshine Law. So that's why I have to answer your question with a yes, but I'm throwing the word probably out there because there will be some factual scenarios where even a private university's documents might be subject to Florida Sunshine Laws. Hope that answers your question adequately. Yes? Uh, using that same example, 
Um, would it the example of the private university? Yes. Okay. So would it be all of the private universities' documents, or only the ones that are the ones that are generated in a public purpose? Okay. So not everything that they have. No. Just whatever is public. No. But probably everything the requester is requesting. Unless the requester is acting in bad faith, the requestor is going to be requesting those documents that were relevant to the public act and the public purpose. So in a given lawsuit, probably the full request is going to fall under the Sunshine Law. But you're right. Now that we certainly have an actor that is not a public entity, that is not meeting the statutory definition of agency under Chapter 120, then we have to ask, what task is it? And if that task is delegated from the government for a public purpose, then the papers regarding that task are going to fall under the Sunshine Law. Because we're not going to simply waive or disregard the public's right to open government in the Sunshine simply because the government decided to hire a vendor or to delegate the task or to get some help from outside counsel or to put the work out for bid instead of doing it in-house. That's not going to be sufficient to me the sunshine laws don't apply here. So that's the answer to that. So did you notice note five? We've already addressed that. Note five and I wrote some questions to consider. Quote, did you notice that the public agency need not have actual possession of the document for it to become subject to public disclosure under Florida's sunshine law? And then I asked this question, which we haven't addressed already. Does this make it difficult for public agencies to keep track of what documents are public documents? And I would suggest the answer is probably yes. Probably does make it difficult for the government to keep track. Here, on the facts of NCA versus AP, we have the Florida State University delegating to Gray Robinson, who then delegated to a lawyer, who then went on a website. Somebody's got to keep track of what website and what they saw because they went on that website as part of their public function of defending the university. So what they saw, in this particular case it was the transcript, what they saw became a public document. So does that rule make it difficult for the government to keep track of what becomes a public document? Absolutely yes, I would suggest. The harder question. Does the fact that the government has trouble keeping track mean that the government need not produce the documents upon a Sunshine Law request? And the answer to that clearly is no, the government remains responsible for producing the document, even though it was hard to keep track of which documents needed to be produced. So the burden lies upon the government as it conducts its day-to-day -day business to keep track Likewise, emails come in and out. It's incumbent upon the government to have a solution in place that preserves those emails so that they can be produced to the public. Members of boards might use their official software to send texts back and forth to their staff and to one another. It's incumbent upon the government to keep track of those texts, to preserve those texts, so those text messages can be produced to the public upon adequate respect request. And likewise, the members of the government, the elected officials on the board of county commissioners, or whatever collegial body is involved, it's incumbent upon them to always use the proper software when conducting government business and to not commingle government and private business. I gave the very controversial fact pattern last week of a government official putting up private server in their basement. And if I'm offended with that back pattern, I apologize, but I was attempting to highlight differences between things such as the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA under the federal government and the much broader, the much more protective government in the sunshine laws that we have here in the state of Florida. So number six, were you surprised that the public agency did not create the document in order for it to become public? And I hope you weren't based on your studies because certainly anything made or received, made or received, or as you see in NCAA versus AP, reviewed. Arguably, 
since Greg Robinson went on a website and looked at a document that was stored in the Carolinas, or where have you, somewhere outside of Florida, arguably Greg Robinson never received it. So we know from NCA versus AP, we're gonna interpret the phrase received broadly, aren't we? To frustrate all invasive devices, right? Such general has exceptions and exclusions, and we looked at that in part C of our chapter. We looked at the use of staff exception. We could call that the broader of the two exceptions, because that's available to any governmental group or entity. Its purpose is to allow government officials to have clerical assistance. And I'm talking about clerks, I'm talking about clerical assistants who ultimately bear no responsibility or authority of their own. So for the lawyers in the room, I'm talking about the difference between a paralegal and a legal assistant. I'm talking about the difference between a paralegal and the telephone operator, or the front desk, or the receptionist, right? There, if you've worked in a law firm, you know that there are certain individuals who do very important tasks, such as answer phones, or file documents into the file cabinet. Important and critical tasks that we're thankful to have, but aren't involved in the decision-making of the lawsuit, correct? So that's the kind of line that we draw between use of staff. But if it's not clear, then we interpret it liberally in favor of why? Disclosure, thank you. The other exception we talked about was a very limited fact-finding exception. And this was not the broader of the two exceptions, this was the more narrow. You saw how narrow use of staff was. Fact-finding is even more narrow than that. The fact finding exception applies only to advisory committees. Now this kind of committee, by whatever name it may be called, that kind of committee is exempt from Florida Sunshine Law only, only if the committee has been delegated mere information gathering or fact finding authority. And it does not have any type of decision making authority whatsoever. Here's a tough question. What if the fact finding committee has authority to determine which facts to look into and which ones not to look into. Now, it no longer qualifies for the fact-finding exception because it had authority to either include or exclude things from the public record. We're not going to interpret Florida Sunshine Law to allow you to evade open government and government accountability by delegating such a decision. What about equity? What about fairness? You've taken a contracts class. If you worked under a contract and the contract turns out to be unenforceable, you can bring an equity claim, right? Say you had a contract with your client for $350 an hour for every tenth of an hour you worked and somehow the contract was faulty. You're still entitled to some payment for your labor and equity and fairness, right? That's contract law. Let me ask instead about Florida Sunshine Law. What about inequity and fairness? The government should be able to exclude these documents. What if they're, they're embarrassing to the government official? They're, they're not favorable to the particular governmental entity. The public might not like what the public reads. In fairness and equity, shouldn't we be able to exclude these documents from public disclosure? No, no. The government can look forward, try to explain away why that isn't embarrassing, or why they took that particular action. There's a remedy available to the government, but that remedy is not, N-O-T, not to hide the documents or the actions from the public. The Sunshine Law requires open government, requires accountability. So don't look for equity or fairness as a judicial, judicially created exception to Sunshine. You're not going to find it. It's not the purpose of Florida Sunshine Law. Who can tell us about NU, NEU versus Miami Herald Publishing Company? And by the way, thank you. Great job covering NCA versus AP. Who wants to cover NU versus Miami Herald? List. We'll pick it up before me. One, two, or three. Three. All right, page three. Oh my gosh, there's only three people on page three. I'm presuming you're not one of them. I don't know. I'll pick the person in the 
I don't know, at the bottom. Drael Wright. Drael Wright, are you here? Oh, hey, you helped me with the batteries. Should I, in return, help you and call someone else? All right, no problem. <laughs> Kat, Katernia? Oh, that's you? Did you want to help us? Yes. All right. Thank you. We've got a volunteer. Can, can we have some applause for the volunteer? Or voluntold, I guess is more accurate. You're voluntold? Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for saving all of us. So the state attorney and the Miami Heralds are seeking a declaratory judgment that the proposed meeting between the city council and its attorney to discuss pending litigation is subject to the open meeting provisions of the Sunshine Law. What? What's going on here? Why does the government want to meet in private under these facts? Uh, because um, the issue was with uh, mitigation. Uh, mitigation. They were discussing the details of this, the strategies. Yeah. The strategies and how to settle. And uh, the question was whether Correct. the discussion would be open to the public. And Correct. So the government's getting sued here. And they want to meet with their attorneys. Who here has heard of something called the attorney client privilege? Sacrosanct in our profession, is it not? Gosh, the Sunshine Law is not going to interfere with the attorney client privilege, is it? Loaded question. Yes, yes, it is. Go on. I interrupted you. Go on. So they want to meet with their attorneys, they want their attorney client privilege. Now, in equity and fairness, shouldn't the government have an attorney client privilege when it gets sued? Just like a corporation or a family or a church or an individual or an association or a union or any other litigant would have? In equity and fairness, right? So, therefore, we can have a judicially created exception to sunshine based on equity and fairness? <laughs> Not quite. No, no, no. How does it work? How can we have both sunshine and attorney-client privilege? How do we do it? You ready? Get your pens, get your paper, get your fingers, typing. Here's how we do it. Government's being sued. It's run by a collegial body. You remember that definition. It's any group that reaches a decision by a vote. So maybe it's the Board of County Commissioners, maybe it's the legislature. They can't settle a lawsuit without a vote. They gotta decide how much. That's gonna require what? Two or more individuals get together. Two or more individuals get together for the purpose of discussing a decision. That's what? That's a meeting. That meets the definition of meeting under the Sunshine Law. So if you get together with your attorney to discuss the litigation, is that a meeting? Yes. Yes, it is. So who would want to attend that meeting? What if you're the plaintiff's lawyer suing the government? Wouldn't you love to attend the meeting where the collegial body says, hey, attorney, how's the litigation going? It's going awful, says the defense attorney. Oh, awful, says plaintiff's attorney, writes that down. Are we going to lose? Well, it's never 100% certain we'll lose anything, says the attorney, but we're probably going to lose this one. I'm probably going to win, writes down plaintiff's attorney. What's that going to cost us, says collegial body? There's no way you're getting a judgment against you or anything less than a million. What's plaintiff's attorney do? Picks up the phone. Hey, client, good news. I'm revoking that $500,000 settlement offer. We've got to get at least a million. Right? Isn't that what would happen? So how do we protect the sunshine law? But yet, grants attorney crime privilege. Here's how we do it. Step one, the meeting starts public and open. Step two, we establish on the record why we need to talk with our attorney with great specificity. Name of the lawsuit, case number, court it's pending in, who's our attorney, representing us against what claims. We then announce that we are going to take a brief recess from the public meeting. We then announce who's going to attend that public meeting. Get all that on the record. The only people who are going to attend are those absolutely necessary. 
plus one other individual, a stenographer, a court reporter, someone who takes a verbatim transcript. We're not talking about notes, minutes, Robert's Rules of Order, outlines. We're talking about verbatim, word-for-word -word transcript of anything and everything that anyone and everyone says at the private meeting. The meeting only remains private as long as necessary, and no one at any time can go off the record. The record is then preserved forever if necessary, because the record will be made public at the end of the litigation. And then, once we've discussed only what was necessary, we reopen the meeting again to the public. This is how we have both the Sunshine Law and the attorney-client privilege. Any questions about how that works? Lawsuit resolves by settlement. What happens to the transcript of the public meeting? I'm sorry, what happens to the transcript of the private meeting? As you can tell by my slip, it becomes public. The entire transcript becomes public. Then the plaintiff's attorney who settled for a million gets to read the transcript about how they were sure they were going to lose, so they set aside three million to satisfy the settlement. No, oh, I settled for too little, says plaintiff's attorney. Some hypothetical facts there, but I'm trying to bring to life for you so you can better remember how this works. Make sense? Who has a question? Maybe I do. Notes and questions to consider. Under New versus Miami Herald, number one. Sometimes the requirements of Florida Sunshine Law may conflict with other laws, such as the New versus Miami Herald, with open meetings requirement of the Sunshine Law, conflicted with the Florida Evidence Code, conflicted with attorney-client privilege, and conflicted with the rules regulating the Florida Bar. Generally speaking, generally speaking, when such a conflict exists, does Florida's Sunshine Law prevail? Who will raise their hand and say, yes, Sunshine Law is prevail, generally speaking. Who will raise their hand like this gentleman and be absolutely correct? Put your hand up, sir. You were right. Who else will be right and say yes? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Generally speaking, sunshine prevails. Generally speaking, sunshine prevails. What about fairness and equity? We'll remember our preface to this section. We talked about that we're not going to allow judicially accepted judicially created exceptions based on fairness and equity. Generally speaking, whether open government, government transparency, and government of the sunshine is fair to the government or not, is not, N-O-T, not a relevant consideration. It's not considered. Notes and questions to consider under New versus Miami Herald number two. The holding in New versus Miami Herald constitutes an unequitable result from the perspective of the governmental entity that is the defendant in the lawsuit. The advice from its attorney about that suit will be made public. Newspapers and others may spread that information far and wide. The opposing counsels in the suits and their clients may learn what advice the defendant's lawyers gave the governmental defendant. On the other hand, Governmental defendant does not learn what advice the opposing counsels are giving to the opposing party. Are such inequities sufficient to permit a judicially created exception to Florida Sunshine Law? Answer is no, for the reasons I just gave. Number two is just a harder way of asking the same question. And number one, just a harder way of looking at the very preface of this section, which is, Sunshine isn't based on equity or fairness. Sunshine is based on a preference for public disclosure, a bias toward government accountability, a bias toward accountability, a bias toward government in the sunshine. You know what else I have a bias toward? I have a bias toward each and every one of you and how polite you've been to give me your time. I hope I've served you well with this lecture. That ends what we've got to cover today. After just a word or two more from this chapter, we'll be moving on to the next for next week. So please read that chapter and read it well. Until then, over question.
I see a hand going up. Yes. So we and no one hates you for the fact that I was about to end the lecture, but you've got a question. We're all cool with that, right? We're all cool. We're all cool. Okay. Thank you for letting me teach you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, midterm's coming up quick. Are you expecting us to know up to the end of chapter three, or do you want to continue on chapter Yes. If we cover it in any way, shape, or form before that midterm, then it is eligible to be tested on the midterm. So yes, please keep up with the readings, keep up with the lectures. I do my best to make the lectures accessible to you on our website. Hopefully they are. So yes, the answer to your question is yes. It's all eligible for the midterm. And of course, it's all eligible for the final. But until then, until next week, may God bless each and every one of you. See you in a week. Oh, I got it right here. I'm bringing it over there. Okay. Right now, I can show you my bag. Pick up. I'm going to get it done. Okay. Okay. Okay.